Go ahead, if you would, please, and get your Bible and turn to the book of Job. And we are going to begin a study verse by verse on the book of Job tonight. And I want you to know that I'm going to try to keep a good pace at it. I'm not going to go so quick that we miss stuff, but we are not going to get bogged down. Some of the verses in the chapters will, will call for us to spend more time on, and some of them we can, big chunks of it, we can get through rather quickly. There's 42 chapters in the book of Job, and I don't want to stay in it over a year. So we'll be cruising some, but we'll get, I believe, exactly how God wants me to do it. I believe that, and I believe, hopefully, and pray that it'll be a blessing to you. The book of Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. It was actually written before any of the books of the law. It's the oldest book in the Bible. Sometimes before 1700 B.C., the date of the book, Usher has it between 1800 and 1780 B.C. There are 42 chapters in the book of Job. 1,070 verses and 18,098 words. Who is the author of the book of Job? There's some dispute and arguing about it. Some say Moses. Some have suggested that it was Job himself, at least some of it. Some say Solomon may have helped to preserve it. Um, there's indication that it was Elihu. And you see that it was Elihu when you... Look over there in Job chapter 32 and some verses over there. That's probably the best. Uh, if I was going to say who authored it, that's definitely who Dr. Ruttman believes authored it. I would go with him. If when in doubt, I'm going to go with him unless somebody shows me something different. So your author is possibly a good chance it's Elihu. Elihu. Um, Job was an incredible man. I don't know how much background you have on the book of Job, how much you know about this man, Job, how much you've been through. But Job was a great man. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, God mentions three men as giving an example of people with righteousness, personal righteousness. And he says in Ezekiel 14, verses 14 and 20, though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, said the Lord God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They should but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. The context of it is, is he's getting ready to come down on Israel, and he's saying, look, I'm not sparing this city. I'm not sparing these people. He said, he said, even if Noah, a great man, Daniel, a great man, and Job were in this thing, it would not matter. I would spare them because these are righteous men, examples of a righteous man. But I wouldn't have any pity on anybody else. And again, a New Testament reference to Job. Uh, James chapter 5 and verse number 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender and of tender mercy. Job was a very patient man. I think you can say amen to that. If you have read the book of Job or know anything about the book of Job, he was very patient. He was very, very patient. Now, what is the theme of the book of Job? And I got to tell you that there's probably different, there, there are many things we'll cover in the book of Job. But I have two different themes for the book of Job. I don't even know if that's proper if you can do that. Because usually you have to say, what is the, the theme of the book? But I believe in the book of Job there is a devotional theme. And I believe there's a doctrinal theme. I believe that the devotional theme in the book of Job is... Why do the righteous suffer? Is there anybody in here ever wondered that? Why do the righteous suffer? Boy, there's been a time or two since I've been here seeing God take all the good people in our church and the death that hit our church. 
And I'm thinking, how in the world can God take him or can God take her from us here in Holy Hills and leave Creflo Dollar? How could he take this dear woman, this dear saint of God, and leave Joyce Myers? How could he take this dear brother right here and leave Joel Olstein? I mean, if, if you've dealt with this any length of time, you know that these thoughts come in your mind and you think about that stuff. So devotionally, the theme of it is why do the righteous suffer? But I tell you, doctrinally, doctrinally, I think the theme of this book is the suffering of Israel during the tribulation period. You're going to see a lot of this stuff that matches the suffering that the nation of Israel, that that Jew will go through during the tribulation period. Also, I want to bring this to your attention. In some places, Job's torments are a picture of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. You will see that in the book of Job. And you will see that it pictures much of the suffering that Christ went, for, went through for us on the cross. And then what he went through as uh, spiritually up there on the cross and the pains of hell that he suffered so you and I could go to heaven. Actually, the word Job, you know what Job's name means? It means one persecuted. And Job absolutely was persecuted. And how you know and can tell that, of course, it's all through there, and we'll cover it as we get into the book. But uh, there is actually one chapter in this book for each month of the Great Tribulation. There's 42 chapters. And there's 42 months, according to the Bible, of the Great Tribulation. And also, the Bible tells us, when we study the book of Job, that Job was on the ground for seven days. That's one day for each year of Daniel's 70th week. Job 2.13, it says, So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. And this is what I want you to understand. The one who persecutes, who actually does the persecuting of Job in this book, is the devil. The one who is going to persecute that Jew during the tribulation period is the devil. And the one who came at Christ, when you read those passages over there in the Old Testament about those bulls of Bashan and all that stuff that was going on spiritually, listen. There was, it wasn't just the blood flowing from Christ's body and the beating that he took physically. Spiritually, when you read in the Old Testament and read some other passages, there was something he was going through up there spiritually on that cross. And there was things happening to him as he paid for the atonement on the cross with his precious blood that you don't see. And so he came, the devil comes at Christ on the cross. And again, like I said, Job is a type of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And this is, listen, this is what I want you to understand about all of this tonight. The devil coming at Job, the devil coming at his people during the tribulation period, and the devil coming at Jesus Christ on the cross was all set up and allowed by God. Do you hear me? It's all set up and allowed by God. And that's why we have trouble sometimes and we struggle when we deal with Job. That's why we struggle when we deal with some of this stuff. And as we get into this here, and what I'm going to do is we'll cover the rest of chapter 1 the next time, the next Sunday night that we're in the book of Job. When we actually get into the text tonight, when we finish the introduction, we're just going to cover the first five verses because I want you to see Job's character. But here's something that I want you to remember and I want you to get a hold of because we're going to revisit this at the end and make some practical application that I hope will help you and do something in your heart. You need to remember this. Dr. John Phillips, the English preacher, was preaching a message on Job, and he said something I thought was outstanding. He's got a good message on, on Job. And this is what he said. Dr. John Phillips said, the great question, the great question in the book of Job is, will Job's experience triumph over his theology or will his theology triumph over his experience now you think about that and as we get into it and, and it unfolds you're going to see exactly what we're talking about 
He said the great question in the book of Job, of course this is devotionally, and, and why how righteous people suffer seemingly for no reason, is, is Job's experience going to triumph, triumph over his theology, over what he believes about God, or is what he believes about God going to triumph over his experience? Now, I will be saying this later when we get into it, but I want you to listen to me very carefully. If you spend any time in the book of Job, you know that there's no man that ever lived on the earth that suffered completely more than Job but the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at it and we get in there and we start getting into the further on into chapter 1 and in chapter 2 when the devil is turned loose on Job, you have never seen a man. He's, he's suffering physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, every way that a man can suffer. He suffers. And listen to me. Listen to me. The devil does it. But do you know who instigates it? God. Now you better, you better start right now preparing your heart for this. There's a lot to the book of Job. That's not just going to deal with our intellect. And when we get into some of that doctrinal stuff and some of that stuff that we find that Job talks about that's very stimulating and very enjoying. But there's some stuff that deals with your heart. When you go through the book of Job, that's very heavy. And you're going to have to, you're going to, have to finish the book of Job and, and say, Is God really good? Is he really right? Was he just in everything he does? And you say, well, I ain't never, that ain't even crossed my mind. Ever. Well, first, number one, you don't know nothing about how what Job went through, so I would just keep down until you do. And number two, you must not have had live life very long or had life throw much at you. Because if you ever do, you will be in a world of hurt where you may not ever renege on your faith, but you will lay your head on your pillow at night and lay in that bed at night and say, Why? Why? This doesn't make a lick of sense to me. Amen? I've done right. Now, I haven't been perfect, but I've done right. I've done what you told me to do. And it just may be that there's something going on up in heaven that nobody understood. Job didn't understand it. His friends didn't understand it. Nobody understood it. Now, they all had their opinions about it. But they didn't know what was going on, and they didn't know the reasoning behind it. We'll mention that just a little bit more at the end of the study. Now, I've divided this book, I've divided it into five parts. This is a very simple, simplistic division. Uh, <laughs> other people divide it. I, I, I've chose to divide it like this. Other people would not divide it like this. But I thought about dividing the book in, in, in five ways, in five areas, by chapters that would make it easy for you to understand and know where we're going. First of all, the first division is chapters 1 and 2. And chapters 1 and 2 is the testing of Job. And then second of all, you have chapters 3 all the way over to 31. And that's the discourse of Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. That's chapters 3 to 31. And then you have the third section. That's the discourse of Elihu and Job. And that goes from chapters 32 to 37. Then you have the fourth division. That's where the Lord answers and he steps into the conversation. He answers and he rebukes Job. That's chapters 38 through 41. And then the final section is the Lord restores Job. And that's the final chapter of the book, chapter 42. Now, we're going to get here in a moment and look at this man, Job. But I want you to remember something. Um, Job is going to be somewhere during the time of, of the people in Genesis. All right? He does not have a completed Bible like we. He does not have scripture like we do. He is not born again like we are. He does not have the permanent 
indwelling of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ like we do. And none of us in here could go through what he did and come out like he did. Okay? So don't, don't think I'm saying anything negative about Job. We're going to see here in a moment that when Job is on the earth, listen to me. The Bible makes it clear that he's the best man on the earth at that time. But yet, there was something in there that needed to take, be taken care of with Job. He has some self-righteousness. He thought he was maybe a little bit more righteous than God. And he got to the place where he thought God had not done righteously by him. And he even said he wanted to have a conversation and discuss this thing with the Lord. So listen to me. If Job can get to that place, don't you tell me some of us can't get to that place. And so you want to be warned about that and look at that and caution about it always. All right. We'll just cover the first five verses tonight. And verses one through five, we're going to look at Job's character. Job was a man of great character. Job chapter one, verse number one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So far, that's a pretty good testimony, isn't it? Now, Uz is the name of a son of Aram. You read that in uh, Genesis 10, 23. Aram was a son of Shem. And Uz, that land where Job was, would have been located in a place called Idumea. Uh, you read about in the Bible. That's in the land of Edom. And where the land of Edom was, or where, where we would have like present day southwest Jordan, across the Jordan, down in, in the country of Jordan. And it is, and over there also is where Petra is. And it's possible, some people think, that it may be exactly where Uz was, was exactly located where the city of Petra is located today. And remember that the city of Petra is where the Jews are going to flee during the tribulation period. And that would make sense if that's where it is, since Job is a type of a tribulation Jew under the persecution of the Antichrist and the Lord allowing his wrath to be poured out upon them. That would, that would make sense. Now, I want you to notice how, how he's described. First of all, the Bible says that Job was a perfect man. Now, don't, don't misunderstand that. Don't be confused. It did not say he was a sinless man, okay? There's nobody that's sinless, but he was perfect. You have to understand, and I think most of you do. You understand the Bible word, when it, the word perfect. Perfect means to be complete or fit or mature. So he was fit. He was where he was supposed to be. He was useful. He was mature. Um, he was a perfect man. He was, he, was, he was exactly what God wanted him to be. So that's his testimony. He's a perfect man. Notice what else is his testimony. The Bible says that he was perfect and that he was upright. Now what it means to be upright is that he lived. He, he lived uprightly. He was a righteous man. Listen, he, he walked in righteousness. He lived in righteousness. That man, listen, that man lived right. But sometimes the problem is when people live so right, they get to looking at how right they live. And we all, all, all of us have to watch out for that, don't we? We all have to watch out for that self-righteousness that can creep into our hearts. And we become unwise, the Bible says, if we compare ourselves with one another. Listen, the only one you and I ought to compare ourselves to is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we compare ourselves to him, we come way, way, way short. Every one of us. None of us measure up to him. And he's the one true measuring stick. So it says he was a perfect man. It says he was an upright man. Thirdly, in that passage, it says he was a God-fearing man. It said he's a man, he's perfect, upright, one that feared God. You know, Proverbs 1, 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know why people are so stupid? They don't fear God. 
I don't, I don't care how many, I don't care how many uh, physics books you've been through and chemistry books you've been through and quadratic equations you know about and all that. If you don't fear God, you don't have the proper knowledge. I don't care what you made on your ACT. I don't care, as Brother Bobby said, how many this morning, how many degrees you got behind your, your name. If you don't fear, if you don't fear God, there's some knowledge you don't have. It says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the, the, the very first thing you got to have to learn anything about God and to know anything about God and to follow God is you've got to fear God. And I'm telling you, that's one thing this nation's lost. This country does not have a fear of God, and I'm afraid it's coming to our churches that they don't have a fear of God. Well, all the nonsense that goes on. And the way many Christians live, they don't have a fear of God. And I'm just, let me just be honest with you because I've been praying a lot about this and mulling this over and asking God to show me about me. And this is sad because I wouldn't have thought this about me. But, but God has shown me that I don't fear him like I'm supposed to. And you know why I don't? Because he's been so merciful and good to me. You know, you get to thinking he's just so merciful and he's so good. He ain't going to drop the hammer on you. You know. I, I know you got that thing in your mind you're thinking about, and you know you shouldn't be thinking about it. And you say, well, I ain't going to be so quick. I mean, it ain't, you know, I ain't. God, God, God's just merciful, and he is very merciful. He is very forgiving. He is still working on us. But one day, one day God can get fed up. <laughs> and I'm telling you what's wrong with many Christians is we've heard so much of this contemporary a uh, modern type of preaching about how good God is, and he is good, and he is merciful, and he is wonderful. But he's still to be feared. He's a holy God. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. He's a God, the Bible says, get angry. He gets angry. And we, what we have in our society now is a lopsided God. But Job feared him. And I'm going to show you the very last verse we'll cover tonight, how much he feared him. He was doing things for his youngins because he feared them. And escheweth, says he eschewed evil. You know what that means? He avoided evil. He was an evil avoiding man. <laughs> See, Job was a perfect man. He was an upright man. He was a God-fearing man. And he was an evil avoiding man. You know, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. It says, avoid it. Pass not by, turn from it, pass away. And that's what Job did. He stayed away from evil. He avoided it. I'm telling you so far, we're looking at a good man, ain't we? We're looking at a good man. And, and listen, listen, not only was Job a righteous man, but Job was a very, very blessed man. Look at what he has here in verse number 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. He had a great big family, didn't he? He had ten children, seven sons and three daughters. And now notice the substance that Job had. He was a very, very rich man for this day and time. A very rich man for this day and time. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. 3,000 camels. You know, we went to this zoo down here. What's that pet and that thing where you ride through there? What? That safari park. And I seen about 50 camels. That was way more than enough. 3,000. Let me tell you something. A camel, a, a camel is aggressive. When he sticks his head in your car to eat the feed, he'll get your hand too. Any of you ever tried to feed a camel? Just thought you might not want to do that. 3,000 camels. 500 yoke of oxen, that's a lot of ox. 500 she asses, a very great household. He had all these servants with all this stuff. And notice what else he had. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Now listen, I don't want you to miss this. You will look at this and you will think he was the greatest man of all of the east in, in uh, finances and that's true that's what this is talking about that in the east where he lived he was the richest man in that part of the world however he, there's something even more important that we hear about job that's more of a great testimony hold your place there and turn to chapter two and verse number three chapter two and verse number three 
it wasn't just that he had more money than anybody in that part of the world. But here's a much better testimony. Listen to me now. You've got to get this. There is a reason why God brought up Job to the devil. It was, listen, listen. It was evil's best going up against the best of humanity. And I'm going to show you that. Job chapter 2, verse number 2. Job chapter 2, verse number 3, rather. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? The, the, the Lord initiates it again. He's already uh, turned them loose on him one time in chapter 1, but here he's coming back again. He says, There is none like him in the earth. Did you read that? There's nobody like Job. He is a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And listen, even after this first round of what he'd done to him, notice what God says about him. And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. He told you in that verse there was no man on the earth at that time as good as Job. And here's, here's, here's the part of that verse that is just mind-boggling. He said, you moved me against Job without a cause. Ain't that what we just read? Do you know what he said? He was saying, Job did nothing to deserve this. And yet I gave you permission to do it. You need to think about that. Maybe you're not thinking about it. Maybe you're not. Maybe you need to think about that. God let the best man he have. He initiated the conversation with the devil. We'll see that next time we're in the book of Job. He turned the devil loose on Job. And he said, you have caused me to let you go against this man. And he didn't deserve it. He's done nothing, no reason to have this happen to him. But I let you do it. God doesn't think like we think. He doesn't do like we do. He's not looking at things. And he said, you move me against him to destroy him without a cause. Now, he was destroyed not in his life. His life was never taken away. But everything else Job has is taken away. Isn't that something? Then in verse number 4, and his sons, listen, and, and I, will, I want to say this before I go to verse number 4. Job was a wealthy man, and I want you to understand that many times in the Old Testament, physical wealth and physical blessings could be sometimes equated or, or associated with spiritual blessings. That's not the way it is in the New Testament anymore. You understand that? Uh, spiritual blessings have nothing to do with money. And you, you give me send in your seed gift so you can get rich. And God wants everybody rich and nobody's sick. That is not New Testament doctrine. And because of this, this may have led uh, Job's three friends to believe that Job was a terrible sinner. Because they, they, that's what came out later on when they were talking about him. But just remember, he's the greatest man on the earth at the time in everything. Now... Verse number four, and his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So what's going on is that Job's children are all together, and they are enjoying one another's company. Isn't that something to have ten brothers and sisters and everybody loves one another? We're just glad to all get along. Job's last name was not Knowles. And I'm, I'm sort of being funny. Yes, our family is loud, and our family will argue and fuss, and people in my family will hurt your feelings. But I have to say that my family is pretty close. And uh, they may blow up and blow out, but if you need them, uh, they're there. You just, you, just have to, you just have to have a thick hide around my family. They will hurt your feelings. But then five minutes later, they'll wonder why you're still sold up about it. So, I mean, you have to just get over it. But I, I mean that. I, I do love my family. Matter of fact, the older I get, the more I love and I'm thankful that I've got a family that may not always do and act like I think they ought to, but they, they've never said we're finished with you. You've never done anything, so whatever that we disagree with so much, we didn't love you. And I could pick up a phone right now with all my aunts and uncles and whatever, and, uh, and all of them, if they could help me, they would. 
And not, not just everybody's got a family like that. I thank God for it, even if they are pretty loud. So, amen. So then we get to verse number five, our final verse tonight. And it was so, you want to see it further about Job's righteousness? It was so when the days of their feasting was going about that Job sent and sanctified and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Job was such a righteous man who was so concerned about his children, listen to me, that he rose up early in the morning and he offered ten burnt offerings, one for each child. And listen, the Bible says that he did it continually in case one of his children sinned or thought something wrong in their hearts. He did it continually. He was so concerned about his children. Have I painted a good enough picture for you tonight from the Bible that this man was a righteous man? Have I showed you that this man had riches, but the riches didn't have him? He had family, but the family didn't have him. He had possessions, but the possession didn't have him. And let me tell you something. He had flesh, but for the most part, that flesh didn't have him. He had a lot more control and discipline over his flesh than many, many, just about all of us Christians who have the Holy Spirit living within us right now. So when we get on later in this book on down the road, don't you dare think I'm taking a shot at Job. All right? He was wrong, and it needs to be brought out where he was wrong. But if you think any of us in here would have done better... And before ever but we get over there and we start talking about Mrs. Job and her statement, curse God and die, which was a foolish statement and she spoke as a foolish woman. I understand all that, but, but you just need to back up if you've had no experience in life. That was, that was that woman that lost all her children. Okay? She lost all of her children. And I heard Dr. Peacock say something some years ago that stuck with me. He said, whenever you see somebody that you know of and they act out of character, they do something strange, they say something or act in a way and that's not like them, he said, there's, there's probably something, they're under some kind of stress or they're going through something in life that you're not aware of. You need to be merciful and patient with them. And that's right. Do you hear me? That's right. Now, I didn't say what she said was right. Now, listen. Go back again to what John Phillips said as we get ready to close here tonight. The great question in the book of Job, he said, is will Job's experience triumph over his theology or will his theology triumph over his experience? In other words, when the bottom falls out on us, and listen, listen, I'm looking at some of you here tonight that you put people in the ground that you love, You've been abandoned by people. You've had horrible accidents. You've had your children break your heart. I know the suffering I'm looking at. And the question that Dr. John Phillips asked about the book of Job, he's asking Dennis Knowles. And I, in return, I'm going to ask all of you, what's it going to be tonight? Is your theology going to triumph your experience? Or is your experience going to triumph and even change your theology? Is God still good when everything's going bad? Is God right when everything seems wrong? Do you still believe the promises of God? Can God be trusted? We're not charismatics. Our circumstances are to never change what we believe. Do you hear me? We believe and we walk by faith and not by sight. Do you know what our statement of faith is tonight? We believe in God. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We believe he doeth all things well. We believe he's never made a mistake. We believe that he doesn't think like we do. That his ways are not our ways. That they are past finding out. And one of the great questions that you find out in the book of Job and all of you are going to be confronted with in your life. Is God right? And what I believe right? And what I'm trusting in right? Am I still 100% dedicated to what I believe this book says? Even though my life is falling apart and going contrary to what I think seems to be right and contrary to what I, I seem to wonder about what the Bible's teaching. That's one of the great questions we find out in the book of Job. And I'm telling you right now, God put Job in such a position that he said, of course he didn't say it, but you can, it, the thought is conveyed in that story. He said, I am going to take that man and the only thing I'm not going to do to him is kill him. But I'm going to make him wish he were dead. And we'll read those passages. Not only does he wish he was dead, he says he wish he was like an untimely birth. He said, I wish I just died at birth. He said, I wish I'd never even been born. Any of you ever got it like that on you? And sitting down in the ashes of despair and in pain and agony, Job had to come to a place was he going to let what he had believed and trusted in God triumph over that horrible, horrible experience? Or was he going to let his experience dictate to him what he was going to believe about God? And as John Phillips put that question to his audience as he was preaching, I'm going to finish up tonight and put that question to you. Every head bow and every eye close.